This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Fantastic sports weekend on tap with not just the Kentucky Oaks today and the Kentucky Derby tomorrow, but also we got a big card for UFC. It is UFC 301. We're going to talk to Austin Swain today to get his read on that card, the two co-main events and other spots where he sees value at FanDuel Sportsbook. Then later on, we'll talk to Austin Cass to get his read on EPL Match Week 36. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research, joined here to kick things off by Austin Swain. Check him out on Twitter at aswain3. You know him from the Heat Check, breaking down each UFC card, talking betting and DFS, where he'll be today later on, breaking down UFC 301 in depth. Austin, happy Friday, I would say, but it's also your Monday because you work the weekends for us at FanDuel Research. So happy Mun Friday. How you doing? I'm doing great, Jim. I, Mun Friday sounds good to me. It's not full Monday. It's not quite full Friday. It's like a compromise, and you've doubled down on Austin's on today's show. And so, uh-huh. yeah, you're right. I mean, we're just loaded to the gills with stuff to do this weekend. So no shortage of it. NBA, NHL playoffs, too. It should be a fun weekend. It is poor planning on my part to have both of you on the same show because I – Every time I try to type either your name or Austin's name, because you're A-U-S-T-I-N, he's A-U-S-T-A-N, I put both in there. It's Austin. Yep. Every time that I do it, A-I-N, and it's ruined my brain. So having you on the <laughs> same show and I type out like the description and stuff, I think that furthers my inability to type either of your names correctly. <laughs> That's unfortunate. You could say it lay- left an Austin on your brain, if you will. Exactly. We're going to go with that. I appreciate your contribution to the discourse here. So we're going to talk about UFC 301 in just one second. But first, if you want to get some insights on the Kentucky Derby, or if you're listening early enough Friday, the Kentucky Oaks as well, check out our podcast from earlier on this week for covering the spread. Talk to Christina Blacker on Monday about the Derby, Dubs Anderson on Wednesday about the Oaks. Find both those on the Covering the Spread podcast feed, FanDuel TV Plus, and the FanDuel YouTube page. The 150th Kentucky Derby is right around the corner, and FanDuel is the only sportsbook app where you can bet it. Plus, all customers can get a no-sweat derby bet up to $20. That's right. You'll get up to 20 bucks back if your derby horse does not win. So bet the derby on the same app where you bet all your favorite other sports, FanDuel. Just download to score your no sweat derby bet up to $20 for the Kentucky Derby this Saturday. It must be 21 plus and reside in Arkansas, Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Montana, New Hampshire, New Mexico, New York, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Virginia, Washington, West Virginia, or Wyoming. Offer valid on first derby win wager, verified FanDuel racing account required. Refund issued in non-withdrawable racing site credit that expires on 6-10-24. Restrictions apply. See terms at racing fanduel.com offer not available in dc kansas north carolina new jersey tennessee or vermont gambling problem call 1-800 gambler or visit fanduel.com slash rg call 1-800 next step or text next step to 533-42 in arizona 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in connecticut 1-800-9 with it in indiana 1-800-522-4700 visit chaosgamblinghealth.com in kansas 1-877- 770 stop in Louisiana. Visit MD Gambling Health Org in Maryland, 1 800 Gambler.net in West Virginia, 1 800 522 4700 in Wyoming. In Massachusetts, Gambling Helpline MA.org or call 800 327 for 24 7 support or in, Ma- in New York, 1 877 Hope and Y or text Hope and Y. Austin, let's begin things off here by talking about the main event for UFC 301. Alexander Pantoja taking on Steve Ursic. Pantoja currently minus 192 on the money line. That has scaled back a bit because it was minus 200 yesterday. So a bit of movement, it seems, towards Ursic in this one. What do you see? How do you see this fight breaking down? Yeah, a, a lot of bu- a movement in this slight fine, uh, line. It was plus 186 on Sunday, so Ursic has dropped quite a bit here. <clears throat> 
I'm so thankful to have my model for fights like this because the good thing about a model is it can remove bias. And I absolutely would have bias here because I have a 45 to one ticket on Steve Ersig to be the flyweight champion at the end of the world here. And I, this shot came way sooner than I was expecting. It just happened to break this way due to injuries, layoffs, and other things in this division. But I obviously, when I placed that, I loved Ersig as a fighter, some of his early peripherals and results. This is truly a Rocky story, less than three UFC fights in he's got three ufc fights now in a title fight from a small gym in australia like this is rocky come to life when you talk about steve ersig facing now a two-time defending um flyweight champion in pantoja obviously the experience was with pantoja here two fights with brandon moreno two fights with brandon roy val in the top five here but i don't know how much to weigh that because the last five fighters that received a title shot within three or less fewer fights in ufc they're five and zero oh in those fights all of them wins by knockout don't know really did what to do with that small trend but if that's the case and experience isn't everything here Ursig presents a lot of stylistic matchups to Pantoja plus 0.93 striking success rate to just plus 0.42 for the champion his head Pantoja's head defense has always been a little squeamish as a guy I've been on Pantoja in the last two fights it's kind of tough to watch at times and Pantoja used 14 combined takedowns to get through Moreno to get through Roy Val what happens when Ursig's size he's got three inches of height and 77 percent takedown defense make those harder to come by my model factoring in experience has Ursig at plus 130 here i think he's still good value in a fight that i have 60.1 percent likely to start round four because it's based on three round data this is a five round title fight but that means there's some length to it and that would be my anecdotal assessment that ursig's a very live dog here and this fight probably has some length to it okay so plus 154 for ursig on the money line right now again that is shortened a bit uh so uh, keep that in mind, but still some value based on Austin's model. Will the fight go the distance? Uh, currently, yes, is plus 120. Any interest there, or is it more, more so just the Ursig money line that you're buying into? Yeah, no, I, I think the total being that close to a pick em is a good indication of length in general. Like, a, a, if you take a look at the round props, Jim, a uh, fight to start round four. Um, I actually didn't even check what it was here uh, before we hopped on, but that it, I, that means that fight to start round four is probably heavily juiced in that direction. Um, I, I do expect length in this fight. In the last two fights for Pantoja, split decision win over Roy Val, uh, over Moreno, unanimous decision over Roy Val, win all 25 minutes. That matches the men's flyweight trends. So this is not a place where you see a ton of early finishes, and that and I think that does verify here with uh, with my model's result. Okay, so uh, the over three and a half is minus 146 right now. You mentioned, I think it's around 60% for that one. Um, mm -hmm. So take that in mind there as it's about roughly in line with what the market has, but still showing value in Ursig at plus 154 for the first or for the primary main event. The co-main event uh, earlier on in the evening is Jonathan Martinez shaking on Josie Aldo. This is a tighter match uh, because uh, Martinez is a favorite at minus 142. So... Seems like it should be a pretty good one. What are you seeing here in Martinez versus Aldo, Austin? So important note, because a lot of UFC co-main events now are five rounds. This one is just three, and that's important to know for distance, for timing, for early finish potential. Jose Aldo, the King of Rio, is his nickname, and he is back here after a 2022 retirement. He's returning when UFC announced a return to his home city. So, like, I get it, and it makes sense. I think this is a brutal matchup for him against Jonathan Martinez, a 30-year-old from Factory X Muay Thai here in my background in Denver. Um, Jose Aldo has really, his signature attribute, 91% takedown defense, patient, lethal counter striker. This isn't the type of matchup where I think that he succeeds when Jonathan Martinez is a high-volume striker, really devastating leg kicks. And the problem in 2024 is that Aldo's coming out of retirement for this bout, his volume hasn't been really up to snuff already, and I can't forecast that it's going to get a lot better now with this time off and what they call ring rust. Jonathan Martinez has a plus 0.88 striking success rate as a one-dimensional striker. Jose Aldo, negative 0.18, and that's just Aldo's lack of volume offensively, even despite a 60% striking defense that's very, very good and what he's known for. Jonathan Martinez, also sneaky power, 1.17% knockdown rate, and we've gotten a couple of ranked wins out of Jonathan Martinez in the time that Aldo's been on the shelf so when you factor in level of competition recency my model also accounts for age uh with aldo now seven years older at 37 i've got martinez at minus 155 now that doesn't show value against his money line but really the angle that i've taken here the fight to end early will this fight go the distance um 
it was uh, it was plus one sixty eight. Now shorten a little bit to plus one sixty six as we sit here live. Uh, I've got that at plus one fifty five. So showing a little bit of value on this fight to end early. And with Martinez's power, with his own recent knockout history, I've got a Martinez knockout around thirty one point two percent. I think that's a great value at plus four hundred. If you go to the method of victory, uh, Martinez by KO TKO is plus four hundred. Solid to me. I was going to ask if you showed value in that, given that you show a bit of value in the Martinez money line. So you said minus 160 something on Martinez to win, correct? I, I've got Martinez minus 155. So I'm actually yes. not showing. Oh, wait, so minus 142. Shortened? Oh, he shortened quite a bit overnight. I, I had him yeah. at minus 166 when I was prepping yesterday. So that's very interesting. Okay, so you got the minus 142 on the money line. You've got the plus 166 for the fight to not go the distance. And then you could check out to kind of combine them. Uh, Martinez to win by knockout. Or do you want to combine? Can you combine? Like, uh... Uh, So if you go to the popular tab on FanDuel, and this is a good yeah. thing to note, you can do a double chance. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah. As far as, uh, are you talking about um, both yeah, of them? So Martinez win? by knockout or submission, three to one. That's the yep. one you were talking about before, correct? Um, I think you can go ahead and skimp on the Martinez submission and just okay. go for the knockout directly because Martinez doesn't have a UFC submission or submission attempt. It's not super likely. Now, unfortunately, you can get burned in UFC settings with this if if a guy is badly hurt and the guy just grabs his neck because all of these guys drain all elements of mixed martial arts. But this is a striking battle. So I think Martinez by knockout has a vast majority of his win equity inside the distance. Okay, that is plus 390 at FanDuel Sports for mm -hmm. Martinez to win by knockout or submission. So Martinez by knockout or submission plus 390. Some consideration towards that fight to not go the distance at uh, plus 166 and also some value in Martinez now that he has shortened to minus 140 or to lengthen to minus 142. So a couple of good ways to get investment into this co-main event. What about other money lines across the card, Austin? Where else is he in value there? So uh, I want to I want to get this out there um, so that people can get a hold of it because we had some weirdness going on at weigh-ins earlier between John Silva and William Gomi in the prelims. Gomi shows up three pounds underweight wearing a t-shirt, which is not often the case. You don't want to cut more weight than you have to. It's hard enough to cut weight as is. Gomi was this was as short as minus one twenty two this morning. John Silva has uh, shortened quite a bit to minus one thirty four because of that weigh-in result. I like John Silva already, so I encourage you to try to get to your sports book if you agree with me as soon as you can. To me, William Gomez is just one of the most frustrating guys on the roster. Just 5.7 significant strikes attempted per minute, not a lot of wrestling upside, and I don't really know how real some of the defensive metrics are when the guys he's fought, they're combined two and three against everyone else. Whereas you look at John Silva on the other side here, you get volume, but it's not at the sacrifice of efficiency. 11.21 significant strikes attempted per minute lands a really good 52% of them, defends 57%. He's got a couple of UFC wins by submission. So we think training with the fighting nerds, this card's in Rio. So this is fighting nerds hometown. Um, I think fighting that, nerds. Yeah. The fighting nerds, they're a team from Brazil. Uh, they actually have three <laughs> fighters on this card, John Silva, Caio Baraglio and Mauricio Ruffy. So those guys should have a, a fun night as teammates together uh, with a little local flavor. But I, I think the fighting nerds, they, they fight really intelligently. They take the best <laughs> game plan. And to me, I think that's very pivotal in this fight with William go me because go me, not a guy that's shown a lot of grappling prowess. Um, John Silva is plus 700 to win by submission here. It's a prop that I've taken a little bit of nibble out, but I also laid his money line. Now I got it at minus 120. I think it is acceptable up to minus 135. So I would act very quickly here. I was not expecting what happened to happen at weigh-ins and I suspected yeah. I have plenty of value on this line when you and I were talking. Okay, so that value is dried up there, but still you can get Silva by submission seven to one. If you like that number, you could still get some value there as opposed to the money line. Any other money lines sent out to you across this card, Austin? Yes, so we'll take a look at the first fight. I think um, I, I faded Brazil in the couple of fights that I talked about earlier in the main event and the co-main event. I want to try to ingratiate myself to the <laughs> fine people of Rio. Alessandro Costa is the local guy in the first fight up on the card taking on Kevin Borges. You look at Costa, he, this guy has been thrown to the absolute wolves in his first th three UFC fights. His opponents are 8-1 and one against everyone else, including Steve Ersig, who we talked about as fighting for a title later. He had to fight Costa, and Costa obviously didn't come out ahead. Uh, but Kevin Borges, on the other hand, 
one fight into his career. It was against a pretty solid prospect in Josh Van, but you largely have to say he flunked out of it. Negative 1.23 striking success rate overall. 56% takedown defense was pretty gettable. And I can I can give kudos to his durability to hang in there through Van strikes, but Costa is a different matchup. Way more power in this division. Six pro wins via submission, whereas Van's not really a submission threat at all. I laid his money line at minus 135, so I think this price is more than acceptable. I'd grade him up to a minus 150 favorite. His activity, his physicality, his grappling upside, level of competition, checking a lot of boxes for a price that I, I don't think is too too shabby. All right. Like you said, that price right now for Costa to win minus 132, and you got value on that down to minus 150 as well. So that's the money lines on mm -hmm. this card. Liking Costa at minus 132, and then eyeing as well um, the... Uh, the Silva money line minus 134, potentially leaning towards the submission prop instead at seven to one. What about other props? What other props are you liking for this card? So I'm taking a look at the featured prelim between Jack Shore and Joe Anderson Brito. These guys right outside the rankings at featherweight. So one of really pivotal fighting for the rankings is concerned. I like Jack Shore by decision here. Jack Shore by points. If you go into the method of victory um, and are looking for that specific prop, uh, it's plus 390 on FanDuel Sportsbook. The reason why that I deep dive deeper than the results, not the just guys, uh, guys on a winning streak is because guys who advance in the rankings, they move up. They typically win minutes. Joe Anderson Brito doesn't win minutes. He was controlled for 70.2% of his last fight, pulls out a magical submission. Previous two opponents before that, just one and four combined in UFC, not really threats to win. Brito was at least a minus 500 favorite in both of those fights. If Jack Shore can survive, because Brito does have decent power, 0.76% knockdown rate, decent submission volume, 0.8 attempts per 15 minutes, I think he's the better fighter. He's got a plus 1.64 striking success rate. Brito's is under one short, really great wrestling threat. 3.42 takedowns per 15 minutes, 40% accuracy. Brito has only defended half of the takedown attempts he's faced so far. Uh, my most likely outcome in this fight that I was able to model thanks to the data here, Jack Shore winning by decision 32.9% of the time, comes out to a round of points prop of plus 210, plus 205, somewhere in there, and we can get this at nearly 4-1. to one. I prefer this to his money line because there is danger to walk through. He's going into enemy soil in Brazil, and Brito has all of this momentum and seems to lean into variance. I would rather take the better guy to win by decision. Um just because he doesn't quite have the same size as Brito, but I think his cardio endurance is better. I think his skill is better, and I think he can cause problems with his wrestling. So that money line you alluded to, plus 148 for sure, but you're preferring the short win by points prop. That is currently plus 390 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Any other props you're eyeing for UFC 301, Austin? Yeah, for sure. I uh, I can't wait to talk to you about my guy, Paul Berju Craig, because he this is a very familiar spot for him. There are actually five Brazilian favorites north of minus 400 on this card. A lot of them seem destined to win, but we, we likely know as you parlay them together, you get plus money. Something is probably going to go awry with one of them. I'm taking my shot with Kyle Baraglio here on the main card. 88% of topology users picking Baraglio. I just don't know if he deserves this money line. I I would rather take this uh, Paul Craig double chance by knockout, uh, TKO, or submission at plus 650. Craig is a weird guy. He doesn't really win minutes either. I talked about Brito earlier. He's willing to give up bottom position. Um, not an extremely clean or efficient striker. But the thing is, this is what he does. He's 6-3 and three in UFC as an underdog of at least plus 170. All of those wins coming via early finish because he's just unorthodox. He's a quirky matchup, but... Craig has severe advantages here. He's he's faced a ranked six straight ranked fighters. He's beaten three of them. This is Kyle Baraglio's first ranked fighter in his career. And it's not like he aced through the the um the entry level of competition because he went to a decision in three of those four fights, submitted a guy who's been submitted four times in UFC. So the re results to expectation for Baraglio. I think Craig is a step up here. I remain pretty unimpressed overall. And when I look at Craig, he's got grappling skills. This is just his third fight at middleweight. Very similar matchup in his middleweight debut against Andre Muniz. One-dimensional guy submitting everybody. Didn't end up working out. Craig was the bigger, stronger guy. I think these odds are pretty decent that it happens again, especially when I get nearly 7-1 to one on him to win inside the distance when he doesn't win a lot of minutes. This is the way I'd like to support him. And obviously, this is not a full unit play if we're going up to like a 7-1 to one dart. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Craig to win by knockout or submission, the double chance market plus 650 at FanDuel Sportsbook. 
And you've done it again, Austin. Uh, a couple weeks ago, you made me watch Pulp Fiction by mentioning the bad mf -er fight. And now, because of Craig's nickname, I will now be forced to watch Inglorious Bastards. So <laughs> once again, thank you. Um, it's a blessing to have these things in my life. I appreciate that contribution as always. That is Austin Swain. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at aswain3. Find his work at FanDuel Research. And check him out later on today on the FanDuel Research podcast feed for the USC Heat Check, breaking down his thoughts on not just the betting card for the slate, but also the DFS side as well. Austin, appreciate the time. As always, good luck with USC 301. Enjoy your weekend. I guess, again, not weekend for you, but we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Jim. I'll see you soon, buddy. All righty. Again, find Austin on Twitter at aceway 3 If you want that UFC podcast right as it is posted, go search for the FanDuel Research Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. But it's not just UFC this weekend. We've also got the EPL because Match Week 36 is coming in hot beginning today, actually. So let's bring on Austin Cass. You can find him on Twitter at Austin Cass. He is a senior editor for FanDuel Research. Time to talk EPL Match Week 36. Austin, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jim. How are you? I am doing great. Are you going to force me to watch a Quentin Tarantino movie by some kind of reference here today? Or am I free and clear of that? If it, if it happens, it'll be accidental. Okay. Okay. Maybe we can get some, uh, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. Hateful eight, work that in there somewhere. I'm uh, trusting you to make this work at some point. Okay. So counting today's match, Austin, we have 10 total matches across match week 36. So a full slate here, which traditional markets are you eyeing at FanDuel Sportsbook? Well, today's match should be super entertaining if you're just looking for something to have on in the background while you're working. But my favorite bet of the weekend comes from Aston Villa at Brighton, which is Sunday. Um, I'm going to take Brighton to score over one and a half goals, which is minus 104. You can find that in the goals tab, and it's listed as home team over under one and a half goals. Previously on here, I've talked about how Aston Villa – are kind of sputtering toward the finish line this season, and a lot of it has to do with them playing in a European competition midweek. I think they're simply running out of gas. Hasn't quite shown itself in the results, but the underlying numbers are not good. They've won the expected goals battle just one time in their past eight league matches, according to FB Ref's XG model. They've given up at least 1.5 expected goals in 14 straight league matches, and now they're likely to be without two key players as a midfielder, Yori Tielemans and goalie Emmy Martinez suffered injuries last week. So you add all of that together, and I have a lot of confidence in Brighton being able to score two goals. Now, I wish I could tell you that Brighton were playing really well and that they've been scoring a lot of goals, but that's not the case. They actually haven't scored multiple goals in the game since February 18th, but their, X and their XG numbers don't look that much better either. But for the first half of the year, Brighton was a, a pretty quality attacking side. They also played in the European competition midweek at various points this season. And I think they ran into the same problem as Villa. They've been knocked out of that competition well before Villa. Uh, Villa's still playing in it. So um, playing at home against a Villa side that's really out of form, just played on Thursday night, gave up four goals at home to Olympiacos in a Euro uh, Europa Conference League game. I think Brighton can get two goals here. And I, I don't mind Brighton's money line at plus 170, but I'm going to play it safer in the side with Brighton over one and a half goals. Okay, so Brighton over one and a half goals, minus 104, in large part due to the fact that they have gotten over their tough schedule, or as Aston Villa is still in the thick of it, a little bit banged up too. The Brighton money line, if you want that, plus 170 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Any other traditional market bets you like for Match Week 36, Austin? Yes, yeah, so it's the same market, but it's the Newcastle at Burnley game, and I like Burnley over one and a half goals. They're the home team as well. Um Newcastle were a very solid defensive team last year, ended up getting fourth in the league. That's pretty much gone out the window this season. They've allowed the eighth most expected goals on the road. They've been really bad. They've given up 34 goals in 16 road matches. And they've struggled against some of the lesser sides in the league as well. They gave up two goals at Nottingham Forest and three at Chelsea, although Chelsea's been playing a little better lately. But uh, Burnley have quietly been playing pretty well going forward. They've totaled at least 1.3 expected goals in six of their last seven matches, including 2.1 at Old Trafford against Man United last time out. Hasn't always resulted in goals, but they're creating chances. And when you combine that with Newcastle's poor defense, I think Burnley have a pretty good shot here to score multiple goals, at least a better shot than this plus 128 price implies. And then one more note that can work in our favors that Burnley are fighting for their lives right now, which can help us out. They're currently two points out 
of safety, and they're in a three-team battle with Luton Town and Nottingham Forest for 17th, which is the final spot of the, of the relegation zone. Every point's going to be huge. So if Burnley get behind, we can rest assured that they'll be doing everything they can to push forward and create chances. And this is a match that I think they'll view as one they can get at least a point from. So I like having that motivation factor on our side as well. And even if they don't win, that push factor, that motivation factor can help us get to this mark, even if they don't wind up winning the match. So that's Burnley over one and a half goals, plus 128 to take on Newcastle uh, in this one. What about player props, Austin? What are you seeing there for match week 36? So I've got one I really like. It's from the first Saturday match, Arsenal at home against Bournemouth, which unfortunately is a 7.30 Eastern time match, but I feel pretty confident that we can place this bet today. We don't need to wait for the lineups to come out tomorrow morning. It's the goal or assist market, which is kind of my staple here. Uh, I like Martin Odegaard at minus 135 to score or assist. He has eight goals and eight assists and 32 league starts. Arsenal have been pretty excellent at home. They've scored at least two goals in 13 of their last 15 home games, with the exceptions being Aston Villa and Man City. Bournemouth, they're not a pushover, but they're not Aston Villa or Man City either. Arsenal are expected to score goals. They're actually minus 140 to go over two and a half goals. So Odegaard should be at the heart of what the Gunners do. He takes some corners, not a lot, but some. And with them going for the title, they will absolutely keep their foot on the gas the entire match. You mentioned Odegaard, a guy who can get to this market either via a goal or assist, which I think is key because if you know if there's someone who's primarily getting here via goals, it may make sense to go more goal score, but Odegaard, a guy who could cash via multiple routes, good matchup for Arsenal, uh, minus 134 for Odegaard to score or assist for the Arsenal versus Bournemouth matchup. That's all we got here for today for EPL Match Week 36. Austin, I appreciate the time. As always, enjoy the soccer. Enjoy... Everything else going on this weekend as well. Appreciate it as always. We'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim. All righty. Again, find Austin on Twitter as well, at Austin Cass, and find all of his work over at FanDuel Research. That's all we have here for today and this week. Hope you all have a fantastic time watching the Oaks, watching the Derby, watching the UFC 301. Big thank you to Austin Swain for swinging by to break down that. Find Austin on Twitter at a Swain 3 Again, check out our Oaks and Derby previews on the Covering the Spread podcast feed, the FanDuel YouTube page, and FanDuel TV+. Plus. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can also find FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across this weekend. We'll talk to you once again on Monday. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>